Mark, tell us, how did you get into the business? Uh, the usual a traditional route of tea boy. Um, I started at uh, a small studio in New Oxford Street called Dick James Studio um, way back in the day and it was there was no kind of uh, like college degree or anything, you just had to go in and make tea, <laughs> which I did for a long, long time. Um, Were you musical before you got the job? Yeah, I was. I was in bands at school. Um, what did you play? played guitar and drums, not at the same time though. Um, uh, both of which I was pretty crap at. No, so no, no formal training then? No, no, no not whatsoever. Um, so just kind of started, I thought, yeah, you know, I'd like to go where they make records, that sounds like a really good job. Um, and it was still part of music, you know, because I, I was, I'd always been passionate about music since being a kid. Um, so I just started writing around studios and eventually found somebody who'd employ me to make tea, um, which I did for probably a year, you know, just on a basic salary and just mm. staying behind as much as I could and tinkering with the desk whenever the engineer wasn't there. Yeah. Um, and then eventually managed to get, you know, to engineer some demo sessions and then built up a couple of clients who'd come back and work with me. So it was just the old school way of getting was that, So Dick James, that was a publisher, wasn't it, Dick James? Yeah, he was, he, he was the Beatles publisher and at, at that time when I started there he was Elton John's publisher. Yeah. Um, and it was really just a publishing demo studio. Yeah, so it was mostly demos and... Eight track, um, old Studer kind of eight track setup. But it was it was really exciting, mm. um, and we had just installed the first MCI package, which was a sixteen track desk MCI desk and sixteen track MCI tape machine. So it was kind of cutting edge technology, yeah. but in a little demo studio. So who did you work with? Any names that we'd have heard of? Uh, there was a few kind of of the pub rock circuit bands like Bees Make Honey and Dave Edmonds and people like that, and some really early kind of pop stuff like the Rubettes and the Bay City Brothers oh, right. and all that Great. kind of stuff um, which was very current at the time. Yeah. <laughs> so how did, what was your big break? Or how did you um, move on from that? I got headhunted by a guy called Marcus Osterdahl who was building Marcus oh, yes. Studios which was built about the 79, same time as they were building the townhouse. I right. Um, the Kensington Garden Square. Yeah, and I was headhunted to be chief engineer and kind of help design and build the place. Right. Um, and there was myself and three other guys who kind of started it off. Mm. Um, so that was quite exciting times. Mm. So you were chief engineer there and presumably did some pretty interesting records there during the early 80s then? Yeah, yeah, loads, I mean loads of really interesting stuff, sort of Marvin Gaye came over and did some stuff. Did a whole load of stuff with Aswad. Um, which I thought was fantastic for a film soundtrack for a film called Babylon, I believe. Um, um, yeah, I mean, it's all sort of in the mists of time yeah. now. But it was, yeah, it was. Really, you were really engineering exciting place. for other producers, presumably. Yeah, I mean, I was just the, you know, a house engineer. Right. Albeit the chief engineer, but yeah. still, whatever clients came through the door, you were right. expected to uh, to record. Mm. And then, so then you went freelance after that? Yeah, about 1983 I started working freelance just because I built up a good roster of producers that I was working for mm. um, and it seemed the time to move move on. Yeah. And then you started producing? Slowly, yeah. First, first kind of stuff I got into was more just remixing or mixing stuff for people um, which was a bit of a new phenomenon you mm. know, in the sort of mid '80s. It was it was the new thing. You'd go to the studio and record with somebody, and then you'd employ somebody to come along and sort of polish it all up. For yeah. You. Um, so I kind of took that route, and it was a very slow move into production um, because I'd always felt that production was was not a destination. It was a journey. You know, the the, the idea of a great production, it's, it's, it's not somewhere you finally get to, it's, it's just a road you take. Um, so I, I didn't have a desire from day one to always be a producer. No. Um, when I first started engineering I was kind of more interested in being a, the world's greatest engineer, you know, right. like to me at the time it was the new Roger Nichols or the new Jeff Emmerich who were the kind of people who I idolised, or yeah. you know, the new Glyn Johns, 
people who knew about recording bands and, mm. and capturing that X factor that bands have when they're playing together. So that was that was more what I was interested in, and then production just became a another logical step. Mm. Um, once I found myself working with producers, where I was thinking, ah, I don't like that arrangement. I, th I could do that arrangement better. So you you know you start to look for work as a producer. Mm. Um, but it's you know that's kind of where it's gone. Yeah. So what was your first success as a producer? Um, Excuse my ignorance. <laughs> um, I suppose the first commercial success I can think of would have been uh, the Primitives Crash, oh, yeah. um, which was top five single. That would have been the first time I could actually go, yeah, you know, I've produced one and it's mm. in the charts. Well, presumably you engineered everything you produced. Yeah. Did you ever work as a producer with another engineer? Did you ever try to? I have done that. Yeah, I have done that. Um, but you tend to find that budgets are incredibly limiting, and if you if you've got to pay a really good engineer, by the time you pay the studio, you paid a good engineer, you're not making any money yourself. And um, I've engineered for so long, I can kind of engineer on autopilot. Right. You know what I mean? I, I can mm. wear different hats while mm. I'm working. I can put my producer's hat on, sit back and think, well, no, that's not quite the right take or you know, whatever. But I can also stick the engineer's hat on and go, crikey, that hi-hat sounds terrible. <laughs> so uh, I, find it, I find it really easy to engineer and produce. Right. But I'm, I'm quite happy um, when I go to other studios to usually find a, a tape-up who's really keen and excited mm. to just give him a few ground rules and let him get on with the engineering. Mm. Cheap way of <laughs> well, it's not. It's not. It's cheap. It's just. I like the fact that when you get a young assistant who's very keen, they've not got any preconceived mm. ideas of how they should do something. So right. you say, "Mic up the drum kit," and you might look at it and go, well, "That's a slightly strange way to mic up the kit," and then advise him how you'd prefer it to be mic'd up. Yeah. Or go, "Well, let's hear that. Then that's, that could be interesting." Yeah. I think you should always be open to hearing different ideas and different interpretations. Mm. Do you think that's an important thing then, as a producer? Yeah, really? definitely. Um, I always find as a producer, or certainly when I've got my engineering hat on and I'm in a new studio, if I want reverb on something, I just turn on a reverb unit and whatever the last setting is, I'll ever listen to because I go, bloody hell, that's a weird sound, but I like it, or God, that's awful, and I'll, you know. Yeah. I don't, I don't kind of go in and go, my reverb setting is this. Yeah. Just, I just like to find happy accidents. Mm. And I think it keeps the creative flow moving all the time. Mm. How, how musical are you then? Do you get involved with? I always, yeah, I always get involved in the arrangements. Right. Um, I think it's really important. It's a it's a major part of production, really. Um, thinking about how the progress of the song evolves, whether you've got too many verses before you hit the chorus, or too much repetition in the lyrics, or not enough musical differences, you know, light and shade. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think, uh, you know, whenever I'm producing a band, I try to spend, if it's an album, maybe two weeks in rehearsal with them right. before going to the studio, mm -hmm. to iron out all the ideas that you don't want to use. Yeah. <laughs> to have a nice big bag full of great riffs and great ideas that you can pull things out of. Mm. Um, and it just, it, it means you're starting from a, a good level. When you when you hit the recording studio, right? And how do you work with singers? Do you have any particular tricks and techniques for putting them at ease? Um, usually, tell them to get their kit off. <laughs> no. Um, um, no, I just try and work one on one with singers. Um, it's singing. The hardest thing about being a singer is the fact you've you've only got your voice. You know your your throat how you're feeling that day in your head and that's it. Um, whereas a guitarist, if they're having a bad day, can throw the guitar off and go, this sounds crap, I can't play this guitar, I need a different guitar. Obviously a singer can't do that. Um, so you, you kind of, I think it's really important to, to build a relationship while the, if you like, while the backing tracks are going down. Build right. a relationship with the singer so that by the time they come to sing, they feel really comfortable with you and able to deliver and able to perform. Mm. Um, 
But a lot of singers like working in different ways, so again, you have to be open. Some singers prefer headphones really quiet, some prefer them really loud, some prefer no headphones at all. Um, some people prefer singing in the control room with the monitors on. So you've got to be able to adapt and, and try and evaluate how that performer best, you know, gets mm. the best vocal take. Yeah. Sometimes you find with a singer that their best vocal takes come when they're in the most uncomfortable psychological position for them, when they're really not happy with their headphone mix, <laughs> you know, but they're struggling and therefore they're, they're pushing themselves. Right. So it's, again, it's different, it's open all the time, yeah. you've got to, you know, every, every singer's got to be treated differently. Really. Mm -hmm. So you've got a lovely set up here in, are we in South Norwood? We are in South, South Norwood. Um, how long have you been here? Um, about two and a half years. Um, I've only, it took me about a year of spare time building the place and putting it together because it, mm. it started life as a derelict building. Right. Um, so I suppose for the last year and a half, maybe two years, I've done most of my recording here. Right. And was that a policy decision based on the way the industry was going? or? Very, uh, yeah, very much so, I suppose. Um, I think with the standard budget for most records today getting smaller and smaller, um, it seemed like a good carrot to have to dangle in front of record companies to go, mm. look, you know, here's a studio, um, I can throw it into the budget or include it in the producer's fee and, right. and you know, make, make everybody happy all right. Mm. Um, and it's a big enough place that I've done plenty of albums where people have just slept here, you know. Right. Brought in their uh, sleeping bags and mattresses and, yeah. and just slept because you know upstairs is big enough in the lounge. But I've had five, six people staying here at one time. Um, it's funky, but you know it works. Yeah, I suppose it uh, helps the spirit of rock and roll. Absolutely, Good camaraderie. Yes, definitely. Um, and b before you got into this place, were you already working with computers and using Pro Tools? Um, <clears throat> I was, but. Generally, in the past, I would produce from behind the traditional recording console, mm -hmm. and I'd have a programmer running Pro Tools or Logic yeah. as my recording medium. Mm. Um, and um, having worked with a lot of good programmers, I just got to the point where I thought I should be able to understand a bit of this myself. Really, you know, watching them, I knew all the things that they did, and I just thought, well. I think I'll get my own one of those. Yeah. <laughs> that looks like a good toy. <laughs> so uh, I'd never actually used Pro Tools before. I'd always used Logic uh, with programmers. But um, after a little bit of experimentation, I found that I liked the way Pro Tools behaved just like a huge piece of multi-track tape. Mm. And I like that. I think that's yeah. really good. Um, so I tend to work with Pro Tools just as if it were a you know, 24-track or 48-track mm. tape machine. Um, and it, it, I just applied the same rules that I would with Logic with Pro Tools and soon found where record was and where play was and yeah. where edit was yeah. and I was happy then. And you've got the, the Control 24 which is the digi-design desk with Focusrite yeah. mic preamps and you've got is that 16 mic preamps there? Yeah, it? there's 16 Class A Focusrites built and into you it. you find that's enough for all um, your inputs? For most things, yeah. I mean, for most band tracks um, and I've always got the... Uh, the trusty, trusty Behringer um, <laughs> copy of a Mac, yeah. uh, which I just run extra mics if I need to. I um, and usually with each job that I do, I'll just hire in different mic amps as and when right. I need them. Um, you know, the 16th start off with um, is a good, good enough starting place, mm. and then I'll hire in for each album various other mic amps. Um, as and when they're needed. And what about outboard? I don't see a huge rack of compressors. I don't. I don't have any need for it, to be honest. So you just record. Um, I just record clean everything. Clean and dry and flat. No, I record everything as I would in the analog world, but mm. via digital. Right. You know, I've got all the usual banks of plugins. Yeah. So I have my favourite plugins that are the same as they would be in the real world. And do you record? The effects Absolutely. as you go. Exactly as so I would So you run do into walk inputs yeah. and then... And, you know, compress things in the same way as I would do when I was recording analogue. Yeah. But it's all software based and I've, you know, I've become convinced that they sound very good. Yeah. Um, do you ever have any trouble setting up headphone mixes? None whatsoever. The, uh, 
latency or any problems like that? None at all. Um, running, um, I've got a Mix Plus system here, um, and I have never encountered any latency problems at all with Digidesign. How do you set up a headphone mix then? Do you just play everybody what you're hearing? Uh, no, um, for each channel on the. I should grab my mouse here. Okay. For each channel up here, you can assign yep. your headphones up here. And you do it on the bus end? You can do it on the same as there. And you just build that across the whole desk. Mm -hmm. And then you can do it in here on the real world. You know, on the everything's on the control surface. So you just use it like you would a good old-fashioned desk? Yeah, it's just for every session. You just build a desk mm. for each session. Mm. However many channels you need for recording, how many you need for playback. Um, I love it. It's fantastic. I really do. It's it's the great thing is that you know I've spent so many years working in analog where I always dreamed of being able to do things. Like, yeah. I wish I could take that guitar and have it with this drum kit or with that bass guitar and try as you did with flying things in off half inch tape. It was always a nightmare and it was never really fully satisfying. But now with um, Logic and Pro Tools. Um, the world is your lobster, as they say. You know, I mean, as far as your imagination can go, you can do anything with it. It's just down to your imagination. Do you, do you find you, you need some goalposts, though, to stop you disappearing off into the realms of experimentation for months on end? Um, no, because I'm always aiming towards a good song, well performed, with a colourful creation around it, you mm. know, a kind of something exciting about it. Mm. And you mix within. Pro Absolutely, yeah, so everything stays 24 bit. Yeah. And then when I go to the mastering room, I just take an SD2 file on right. CD, run it into the mastering. Hey, Where'd you master? Abbey Road with Chris Blair. Yeah. Top man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, that's for me, it's great because that's the only time it hits analogue. So I haven't got to mix it down to that or half inch or quarter inch or yeah. whatever format. It's just, it leaves. Here and arrives at the at the mastering suite exactly as I left it. Yeah, and you're happy with the way it all sounds internally. With Pro Tools. Absolutely. People yeah. talk about sometimes splitting up the different outputs because of the way it sums things at the. the mix. I well, I always bounce it down in uh, dual mono. I always do my mix in dual mono rather than stereo interleaved. Right. You think that sounds better? Uh, I believe. So. Yeah, I kind of convinced myself. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. seems most mastering rooms can handle that, you know, can import that. What about favourite plugins? What, what do you grab if you want an EQ? I know you've got a Waves thing up on the screen at the moment. But yeah, yeah. Somebody got um, all those. I don't know, it's, hard, it's a hard question, that one. Let's have a little look in my bag of <laughs> stuff, shall we? No, just if you, you know, just I'll, that I'll vocal needs a bit of top. Yeah, what do you reach for? That, that's one of my favourites. Fills the bank, yeah. yeah good. And I've got a special. Uh, Chris Blair Abbey Road setting on there, uh -huh. which mimics the old EMI channels. Oh, I see. The, uh, all the Q settings already. Yeah. It's, it's the old mastering board at, in Chris Blair's room. Yeah, it's um, the EMI. It's the EMI. I can't think what it's model it is. A TG512 or something. Yeah. So I've mimicked a kind of generalisation of that EQ, I and see. I love it. It's yeah. just, it just sounds great. It's really. It's really, really musical, and I know that's a kind of a, a cliched expression for EQ, but the choice of frequencies on that old EMI board are fantastic. They're yeah. just, you know, you, each each little frequency, you go, oh, I wish that guitar was a bit more, and you go, oh, yeah, there, there it, it is. is, you know. Yeah. Or vocal had a bit more halo around the top, and it's it's all there. It's, yeah. it's, awesome. and you it's a great it. place to start from, using that as your starting bed.